Hi, this is Diane McBain, and I am on Life and Laughs Podcast with Johnny and Elias. <laughs> Welcome to Life and Laughs Podcast. Johnny Sanchez here with my co host from the West Coast, Elias Israel. And on our celebrity hotline right now is a legendary Hollywood actress who is known for her many appearances in iconic TV shows such as Surfside Six. Maverick, Batman, Dallas, and popular movies like Parish, Spin Out, and many more with such stars as James Garner, Roger Moore, Troy Donahue, Elvis Presley, Debbie Reynolds, Joan Crawford, the list goes on and on. She actually has a new book titled The Laughing Bear, available at Amazon.com. I'm thrilled to welcome the Life and Laughs podcast, the wonderful Miss Diane McBain. Welcome, Diane. Well, thank you, Johnny and Elias. Nice to see you, or talk to you, I should say. <laughs> yes, we <ma'am. laughs> <laughs> We can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> what an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you so much it for is. joining us. Well, thank you. I'm, it's my pleasure. <laughs> now, you were born in Cleveland, Ohio. Tell us how you got from Cleveland to Hollywood. How did that happen? Oh, well, my parents are responsible. Um, it was during World War II, and um, my father was in the Mediterranean on a ship as a sailor, and my mother really got sick of the cold winters in Cleveland. And so she and my aunt and my grandmother's all packed up and we moved to California. We came here on the train. You know those things that they used to travel on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and it, I, it was probably a very long trip because um, I do know that my mother uh, told me a little story about how she had to get up and go to the restroom in the middle of the night and the ta- the train lurched and my head hit her right in the eye, giving her a black eye. Oh, so, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so your parents, you, they didn't move you out there to pursue acting. It, that happened after you moved to Hollywood. Oh, yes. Many, many years after. I, I was, uh, well, I was a, a young teenager when I started acting at the Glendale Center Theater, which was a theater, obviously, in Glendale, California, where we lived, and um, I was encouraged to try out there, and I did, and I did several plays for them, and um, Sally Biano, who was the uh, talent uh, person at Warner Brothers Studios, was out looking for talent, and um, he came to our theater, and he saw me perform, and so he um, took me to Warner Brothers and introduced me to the... um, people who were making a film called Ice Palace, and um, that was going to star Richard Burton and Robert Ryan and Carolyn Jones. I know those are names that a lot of people don't know anymore, Um, but it was a very big film, and um, so they needed a young girl to play the ingenue role. Wow. So right out of the gate, you're in with these legendary actors and actresses. That's incredible. Yes, it was a very scary and, um, oh, life-altering experience, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, and I wasn't really prepared. I, as, you know, even though I'd done some plays, I had never really done very much tel- um, uh, film at that time, although I did do a couple of TV shows for them before I started on the film. Um, I did a Maverick, which was, um, you know, you remember Jim Gardner? And, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. The actors yeah. love him. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, so, um, I, you know, I had that little tiny bit of experience, but it was very little. And here I was with, with Richard Burton. He was playing my grandfather, um, aged, of course, he was 32 at the time, but they aged him during this movie. Mm-hmm. It was a three generational kind of film. And, um, uh, you know, uh, that was pretty scary. I can imagine. <laughs> well, they signed you after seeing you just in the play that one time, like you mentioned, uh, they signed you right on the spot as a contract performer. Explain what a contract performer is and, and how that works. Yes, well, that was a long time ago. They don't have contract performers any longer. Um, The Warner Brothers had um, what they 
called a stable of actors and um, they all got a weekly salary for 40 weeks out of the year. And, um, but Warner Brothers had complete control over what they would do um, at the studio. And so they were assigned things. And I was assigned, obviously, to uh, do Ice Palace, but I was also assigned to be in the television series Surfside Six, which was, you know, a kind of a popular show at the time, actually. It was very popular. Yeah. And um, so uh, that's what it was. And uh, they stopped doing that um, when the Sherman Antitrust Act came into play. Um, the studios um, weren't, they owned theaters. And uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act said, no, you can't own your own theaters because there's no room for any competition. Mm. And that was very true. And um, filmmaking actually uh, blossomed after that happened, but it also meant that I no longer had a contract. Oh, goodness. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was released from the studio and um, was on my own, which was also a life-changing uh, experience. Yeah, sure. Yeah. When you were under contract, uh, if you got an offer outside of the studio, were you able to take that offer or does it mean you're exclusively with that one studio? Yeah, well, they called those loan outs and I still got the same amount of money as my contract called for and it was paid by the studio, but they loaned me out to do um, a film with, um, oh dear, now I'm going to forget his name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Polly Bergen was in it. She was a star in it. And Joan Crawford uh, was in it. You may remember her. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, Robert Stack. Um, I almost forgot his name. Um, Robert Stack, I was the supposed to be the um, romantic lead with Robert Stack. Oh. And um, so I was loaned uh, to uh, a producer outside of the studio. And we did the movie. It was... Um, a story about a, a psychiatrist who believes that um, institutional um, living for people who were um, having mental problems was not the healthiest thing at all uh, to do with them, and he suggested halfway houses that would take a person who wasn't, you know, really bonkers and you know, uh, hitting their heads up against a wall but were, were pretty stable, and then they would stay in these halfway houses, and it was a very new concept at the time, and that film was actually viewed at the White House oh, wow. because they were interested in um, what, the, you know, to do about mental illness and about um, institutional mental um, in, mental institutions in the country, wow. which were not operating very well. You're well known by this point at a young age at 19, basically 1920, you are one of the, I guess we could say the, it go to girls for the studio um, because you had a lot of success from your first movie. And so you're, you're a gorgeous movie star now in Hollywood. You must've been sought after romantically by some of these celebrities that you worked with. Any celebrity dates you can tell us about? Well, <laughs> maybe I really shouldn't. I don't know. Um, but they're all gone now, so I suppose it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, Richard Burton um, took a fancy to me, which was very flattering. Um, I, Troy, Troy and I had a very close friendship, and um, it never really turned into um, a romance, although we did try to make it a romance, but it didn't quite make it. And um, Lee Patterson and I had some time together. Um, he was in the series with us. And uh, let's see, who else? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it, you know, there were quite a few people in my life at the time. And I, you know, I enjoyed um, meeting a lot of very famous people um, from different um, walks of life, actually. Um, I don't know if you would remember Pancho Gonzalez, but he was a famous tennis player at the time. Okay. okay. And um, we dated for quite some uh, time. I have one and, to ask you um, about that I saw you post on your Facebook page, a picture not long ago, was the big TV mogul Aaron Spelling. 
Oh, yes. Well, yes, Aaron and I dated a little while, for a little while, and he he actually asked my dad if he could um, ask me to marry him. Um, Whoa. My dad said, sure, you know. <laughs> 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 but it's her choice, you know. It wasn't like um, my dad had any control over me at all. But <laughs> I thought it was very gallant that he um, asked my father if it would be okay. <laughs> sure, sure. So why did that yeah. never take place? Why did, what happened there? Well, uh, he just, didn't appeal to me that much. I don't, I'm, you know, I now I wish, of course, that he had. Um, <laughs> he certainly, <laughs> he certainly turned in to be quite a large, huge producer. He was, yeah. he was, he was on his way up at the time, and um, and he was famous for his um, work. But you know, I just was a very independent young woman, and. Um, I just didn't take to him that much. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I really am because yeah. he was a he was a nice man. He really was. Yeah, you probably are reminded of that every time you drive by that spelling house. <laughs> out there. Yeah, well, it's it's a little big for me though. I don't think I could have been happy. <laughs> yeah, <there. laughs> yeah. Um, well, you mentioned yeah. Troy Donahue. Uh, your chemistry on screen mm -hmm. with him in Surfside Six was so great that they matched you two together in the movie Parish in 1961. Uh, as well mm -hmm. as Connie Stevens. Um, now, yeah. that film was a hit, made over $4 million. So how did your life change after the success of that film? Well, um, let's see. Um, it was pretty successful. I did another film um, called Claude L. English, and I uh, starred in that as uh, the uh, uh, title role, which was... Um, quite a, a wonderful opportunity to um, do some serious acting. And um, so that was wonderful. Um, let me see what else that came out of that. There were, well, um, you know, the rest of my career pretty much came out of that uh, period of time. Yeah. I know in 1963, yeah. you were in the movie Caretakers with Joan Crawford, who I heard made things a little bit difficult for you. Tell us about that experience. Yeah. It was very, very difficult, and, and that's, that was the movie I was um, loaned out for with um, Robert Stack and Polly Birkin. Okay. And um, quite a few of us were in that. Even uh, Van Williams was in that with me as well. And um, she, uh, we went to the set uh, prior to my start date, and I had gone out to lunch with my friend who, who was so enamored with Joan Crawford, he couldn't keep himself, you know. <laughs> he was just <laughs> so excited about meeting her. And he insisted that I dress up in a beautiful outfit for lunch and um, a picture hat. And so we marched on to the set after lunch, and there she was standing there. And she took one look at me and said, oh, <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I don't know what she was really thinking but that, the expression on her face was not positive yeah um, <laughs> but anyway um, Robbie my friend was very very excited about meeting her and he just didn't you know he only noticed this as an afterthought that it probably was the reason why she didn't like me. And Joan had what they called the completion bond on the film. That meant that, um, it, you know, the money would be there to complete the film, but only if she wanted to be, it to be. So the director was very beholden to her, and so she had a great deal of control over how the film was um, done. Right. And so... She made sure that any time we were in a, a scene together, that I would be kind of um, sidelined. Oh, no. Mm. Yes. So um, my role became smaller and smaller and smaller, and she had all of the romantic stuff with uh, Robert Stack and I taken out of the film. Oh, what? Yeah, and so I, I ended up, you know, kind of almost a, 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 an afterthought in that movie. Um, 
practically an extra <laughs> by the time she got finished. <laughs> so she was that intimidated by you, apparently, because uh, in your movies, I mean, yeah. even then you were gorgeous. I mean, you stayed gorgeous throughout your life. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with Diane, which I know the majority of us are, but she was a knockout, gorgeous, young beauty. Uh, and I can see why Joan may be intimidated by you walking onto a set that she wants all the attention well she was and in the mo in the film she was a nurse sort of a nurse ratchet type yeah. and so she was not attractive in that film at all <laughs> and you know she felt threatened she did and, and it was understandable but um you know what she did was really i thought unconscionable you know i wouldn't have done that even though i suppose i would have been threatened by a young star let <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> under the same circumstances yeah. um but you know she she was who she was and she was very extremely competitive and that was her you know her doing yeah. so anyway it, you know it, it turned out fine um I, I, I like i said the film was viewed at the white house and it was important um that she that uh that the system of uh, institutionalism um, come to an end, and I'm glad it did, yeah. um, because uh, people were just going crazier in, in these institutions rather than getting better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I have a quote here from you where you once said, I was very stupid about money. My mother had always made my clothes, and I was embarrassed about it. I became a shopaholic and spent a fortune on store-bought clothes. Tammy, I like this. You said, Tammy Baker probably copied the way I did my shopping and eyelashes. Was it, was it really so bad that it caused any maybe financial problems for you? Was it that bad of an addiction? Well, it was an addiction for sure. It was a shopping addiction, I guess they would call it. Yeah. Um, it was definitely, and it did. It cost me. I, you know, what I should have been doing at the time was investing in property out in Woodland Hills. Yeah, yeah, sure. Really? <laughs> because it was very cheap at the time and undeveloped. <laughs> And um, I could have made a small fortune uh, if I had done that. But, I, you know, I was very stupid about it. And I didn't care much about it. And I never really cared much about money, to be honest. It was, it was hard for me to really get all that interested in having it. And I always sort of thought, well, when I get married, my husband will certainly be able to take care of me. So why should I worry about it? You right. know, that, those <laughs> right. were my justifications. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I did notice also, because in, in a lot of your films, probably the majority, you were usually cast, especially when you were younger, as a bad girl or maybe a spoiled <laughs> rich girl type on film and TV. Did that bother you? Yeah, it did. I I always wanted to play, you know, um, other kinds of roles, but uh, they kind of tapped me as the femme fatale. And um, that's what I ended up doing mostly uh, in mostly in television. Actually, as uh, time rolled on, it became um, more of my career than the filming, uh, the films, the major films. So, um, but you know, that's the kind of a character that I usually played, and it bothered me. It did. I wanted to do other things. Yeah. But um, you know, in those days, you well, it was different. And um, especially during the 60s, um, I mean, rock and roll and all of that, sure. um, it was just a different time. And my type actually was starting to go out of fashion um, because in the mid-60s, there was the um, revolution against the war. The kids, you know, were all um, against uh, the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And um, they were starting to live a very different lifestyle, and movies were um, uh, taking up young girls who were pretty. They were pretty, but they just weren't glamour girls. Right. And I, I was a bit of a glamour girl because I had blonde hair, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Kind of type too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if if people want to see what I looked like, then they can go to um, my Facebook page. Yes. And see me, and or or they can even Google me. Just put my name in Google, and it goes straight straight to um, some 
menus that uh, yes have one of me. the most gorgeous girls of your era for sure um especially oh, now, no. the first i have to say the first movie that i saw you in was an elvis presley movie we're uh, elvis fans here we've done some elvis podcast series with family and friends but the movie spin out i just thought you were uh, you kind of took the to, for me, you know, you took the attention away from Elvis, and not many people can do that, you know. And so, oh, really? Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that, but okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> that movie actually played on TCM Turner Classic Movies just um, a little over a week ago. Yeah, it yeah, did. yeah, it was, and um, I, I, I didn't get to watch it because I was busy doing something else, but. Um, it, it was a very, it was a fun movie to do with Elvis, and he was, he was a charming fellow. I liked him a lot, and we had a, a nice rapport. Yeah. Did you ever date Elvis? Did he ask you out on a date? No, no, I, I wasn't really his type. He liked uh, darker girls. He liked um, um, brunettes, mm -hmm. and I was blonde, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was not his preference. But. We were friends, and we got to be very friendly, and I really appreciated that because, honestly, I wasn't sure I would want to go out with him anyway because his lifestyle was just so um, it, difficult. Yeah. It was difficult. Yeah. And, um, he, you know, he had a, a coterie of men who followed him around and took care of his every need, and... Um, and of course, the women who could tolerate that um, were the ones who got caught up with him. But um, I, I just—it doesn't appeal to me at all. Yeah, yeah. But he did as a person, and we had some very wonderful discussions on the set, and uh, had a good friendship. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was very nice to you. Was he prepared on the set? A lot of people think he got star treatments. You know. Uh, for being in his yeah, movies. Well, he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he certainly did. Um, he, no, he was prepared. He was good. He was um, good at what he did, and he wanted to be an actor. Um, so whenever he had an opportunity, even though they, they were kind of flimsy uh, little movies that he did, um, he still was interested in proving that he could be an actor. And uh, so he was, he was prepared. He did his work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to ask you about this because in August 1965, your parents reported you as missing. It turned out you had checked into a hotel in San Diego under the name oh, Lord. Marilyn Miller yeah. saying you had been despondent over maybe slackening income, maybe not getting the type of roles you wanted. What mm -hmm. led to that event in your life at the age of 24? Well, my parents had borrowed my car to take uh, a road trip to um, – out. They took a two-week road trip, and um, I had a, that was a Lincoln Continental, and it was a nice car. And I borrowed their car um, in the meantime, and I, I was living in um, uh, close to Beverly Hills, right uh, adjacent Beverly Hills, and um, I had a house, and I, I just I was getting despondent because um, I wasn't getting the roles that I had hoped I could have, and. Um, I, you know, was um, kind of struggling. Um, and so I, I just decided to take off um, and ta I, I drove their car uh, down to um, the Coronado Hotel in, in Coronado, um, it's near San Diego. And it's a beautiful place. And I remembered it because I had been there before. Um, can't remember why, but I was. And I loved it, and I thought, well, you know, that would be a nice respite from, um, uh, certainly from fame, because I didn't want to be recognized while I was there. And um, I wanted to meet people, humans, you know, real humans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't a lot around me at the time. And so um, I thought, well, this is a way to do it. I'll, I'll meet some people, and, you know, we'll hang out, and we'll do stuff, right? Right. And um, and and so my parents, you know, God bless them, they came home a little bit early from their vacation, <laughs> and um, discovered that I was gone, and they didn't know where I went. They had no idea. We didn't have cell phones back then, right. so I didn't let them know, you know. 
And um, so it, 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 they were scared. They were afraid that something might have happened to me because there had been some incidences. Um, a fan, for instance, on, um, on one occasion walked up onto my driveway when I was um, uh, doing some gardening. And, um, you know, I, I, I had told them about that and they kind of felt a little insecure about sure, my safety. Yeah. And um, so they were terrified. So my dad went over to um, a, a police station near where they lived and um, reported me missing. And a reporter happened to be there at the time, wouldn't you know it, <laughs> and happened to overhear the conversation oh, <laughs> with the, um, the, pe- the people at the police station. And um, then all, all hell broke loose. Mm. Um, oh. And it, it, was, it was very embarrassing, actually. I, I, I felt very... Um, uh, oh, you know, I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I put everybody into a, uh, a a situation that was very unpleasant for everyone, my family especially, because right. they were terrified. Yeah. 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 Well, in 1967, during the second season of the ABC series Batman, you played socialite Pinky Pinkston, a friend of Batman yes. series Bruce Wayne. Now, you had pink hair pink outfits, and a pink dog. <laughs> what did you enjoy most I about did. that role? Well, um, actually, what I f- remember most about it, of course, the the pink stuff, that was always, that was difficult to, uh, to cope with because of the dogs and the hair and all that stuff. <laughs> but, um, but the other thing that I remembered most about it was that it was a combined show between um, Batman and the Green Hornet. And they put those two shows together, and uh, my friend Van Williams, who had been in um, a couple of things, uh, the Surfside Six was the series that we did together, and then uh, the the Caretakers, the movie, we did that together, and 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 so here, you know, we were um, together again, and um, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun to see him and to work with him again. And, um, well, we just had a good time. Yeah. We just had a good time. Yeah. Yeah. That show has become such an iconic show that it's made you kind of a cult uh, figure in that show. Do you ever attend any, like, the Comic Cons and those type events? No, I haven't. Um, not that I wouldn't. I just haven't. Um, uh, you know, and traveling for me now is a little difficult. Sure. I, I don't like to fly that well much Mm -hmm. the the airplanes the way they run everything is is difficult for me so um i i kind of stay away from traveling now and um so unless they come to my part of the country and my part of the world Mm -hmm. in my city (laughs) um, (laughs) i'm not really interested (laughs) within a three mile perimeter yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's skip ahead um, to the 70s, to the 1970s. You kind of slowed your career uh, somewhat okay. to care for your son. Uh, is it Evan or Evan? Evan. Oh, that's my son's yeah. name also. Oh, oh, yeah. well, that's a terrific name. Yeah, yeah. They're, it's great. <laughs> yeah, Now you continued, exactly. You did continue to make guest appearances in a number of television series into the 80s, such as uh, The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams, Hawaii Five-0, Charlie's Angels, Eight is Enough, Days of Our Lives, Dallas, and Knight Rider. I've always wondered what it was really like working with Larry Hagman. What was your experience with that on the cast of Dallas? Well, Larry was a, a cool fellow. He was, he was a very nice fellow. Um, but I didn't have to, I didn't work with him directly in that. Um, now, I can't remember her name. Isn't that awful? But anyway, um, uh, not remembering her name, but I was, I was paired with her more um, than with any of the male characters in that show. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you get along so, well with other female actresses? Because I've heard stories how a lot of times th- that's kind of chaotic when female actresses are on the same set, at least back in... Uh, on some of those shows in the seventies and eighties, did you experience any any issues there? Well, it can be difficult, but not because of me. Because I'm always a very friendly person. I I have no interest in being competitive with these people. 
Um, um, I like people. Um, but if they have a problem with me, then I'll probably have a problem mm-hmm. with them, depending on their personality and so on. But, it's when you show you know, up in that big know. hat. Oh, well, if I show up in that big hat, then I'm in big trouble, aren't I? <laughs> yep, that's the, that's the curse. <laughs> what, what about the girls like on Charlie's Angels? Because that was the, the, all the leads in that were female. Did you get along well with those girls? Yeah, I got along fine. I didn't have any problems with them. They were very nice. Um, they were very busy, um, so they didn't have much time to spend with me. But, um, yeah, no, it was fine. It was fine. We we got along just fine. No problem. Well, you also work steadily in regional theater, which I love. I've done several plays, so I know what that is like. And So what did you like most about working in theater as opposed to TV and film? Well, you know, I actually, I preferred film. Um, I, that probably, probably because I was more used to uh, film than I was to uh, doing stage work. Sure. But I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. It, it could be fun. Um, I did uh, Star Spangled Girl at one point, and that was um, that was traveling with Eddie Burns and Carlton Carpenter. And Eddie, when he came on to me the first night of the, uh, we were there, we were in a hotel in New York City in rehearsal, and he came on to me, and I just wasn't interested in Eddie, and I think he was even married at the time, so oh, wow. oh, wow. I wasn't um, going to um, hook up with him. So um, I kind of turned him down, and, and from that point on, he turned the cold eye to me. He oh, just, you know, <laughs> became very chilly. Oh, and Carlton, God bless him, was a wonderful person and a great actor, but he was gay. <laughs> and so he wasn't going to hang out with me, you know. He wanted to hang out with his, you know, friends. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, it, 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 um, we had a good time when we were working, but when we were not working, it was kind of a lonely time. But I did meet some interesting people. I met a lady who was... Um, uh, the heiress of the Otis fortune, oh, it was wow. Otis elevators. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. And, but she was a very simple human being. She was lovely. I really enjoyed her company. I stayed at her house and it was a very old um, house in Connecticut. I believe that was. And um, it was like a 200 year old house. Oh. And she would, she would take me to these graveyards. And we would do grave rubbings. Have you ever done that? No. Or do you even know what it is? <laughs> no. Um, I, I have an idea, but why don't you tell us so, before I embarrass myself? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, you know, they were very old graves um, it, back in Connecticut. I mean, these were graves from the 1700s, 1800s. Oh, wow. And there were a lot of uh, children, babies, you know, that uh, died early in life. Mm-hmm. And a grave rubbing was you took the uh, headstone and you took a piece of special paper and then you um, you um, took a pen. Well, it was more of like a charcoal thing and you rubbed it uh, against the um, grave stone. And when you were through, you would have the outline of the names and the dates of the people who had uh, Mm -hmm. passed away and whose gravestone they were. Yeah. So it was a representation of the gravestone. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love going to look at, and when I'm in cemeteries to, at the headstones of, you know, the older dates, especially the ones that have little stories or, I mean, I'm very interested in history and, and people that came before us like that. I think that's really cool. Well, you live in that part of the world, don't you? I mean, in the South, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of history there, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there really is. Well, let's skip ahead now to the 1990s when you appeared, and some of our younger viewers may be aware of, of one of these shows, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I think you played the grandmother of the lead character in that Melissa Joan Hart. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And that was that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that. She was a charming little girl. Um and we we you know, we worked well together and she was um she was easy to um to be with and to work with. Yeah. And uh so it was a fun it was kind of a fun role, you know, I was I was a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So are there any differences, which I'm sure there are, maybe you can tell us some of the differences between TV sets, for example, when you did that show as compared to when you first started out in TV, the way things are done, or or are they still pretty similar? Well, no, they are pretty similar. Um, TV is extremely difficult because there's so little time to accomplish some important things. And um, like, for instance, you, it takes seven days to film a, an hour show. And seven days uh, it, compared to two or three months on a major motion picture, excuse me, is, um, uh, you know, a very short period of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you're, you're pressured to um, be, you know, Johnny on the spot. You've got to be ready and you have to be available and you have to be um you, you have to be able to perform um, quickly and do it in one or two takes at the most and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, that's difficult and that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, so that was um, that was a, a major difference, but it was always the same. Um, it was true back in the early 60s doing television. Um, our shows, we, you know, seven day schedule and that was it. And um, you had to do what you had to do. Sure. And yeah. uh, you had to do it well right away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were on several other shows as well. Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, uh, Invisible Mom 2, The Young and the Restless, and Days of Our Lives. Did you like doing soap operas? Yeah, well, yeah it was okay. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, you know, that, that, there again, you know, in, in that case, you have one day to film an hour show. Just one day. It's wow. not seven days. It's one day. Yeah. Um, so um, that is a, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. And you have to do it in no more than one take. They just won't do another take if, yeah. you know, if you have to or if you feel like you want to. Well, no, forget it. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to be prepared and you get one rehearsal and then you film and that's it and you're done. And um, that, that's, that's very difficult to accomplish. Um, I did it, you know, obviously. Um, and, um, and it was kind of interesting to meet some of the people who were on the shows and stuff like that. But, yeah. um, but you know, that was, that was difficult. That was yeah. very difficult. Well, you've had an impressive body of work for sure. And you also began writing screenplays. What made you decide to start writing? Well, I always wanted to be a writer um, and never really had much of an opportunity. I was so busy um, filming and doing uh, things that uh, supported the filming that um, I didn't have time to really do any writing. And then, so, you know, later on, as time wore on, I wasn't quite so busy and I had the time. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try doing some screenplays and see if I can't, um, uh, you know, sell a screenplay, which I never did, by the way. I really wish I had, but I couldn't. I, um, you know, put my effort in and wrote quite a few. And um, I wrote one about the uh, Tiananmen Square Massacre. Um, We went to China to um, research that um, quite secretly, as a matter of fact. Uh, We were, uh, my partner and I were um, guests of the Chinese government to look at their uh, criminal justice system, which is different from ours, as you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my partner was a judge in Northern California, um, appointed by Jerry Brown, and he had an institute where they had an exchange program between the Chinese and the Americans uh, going. We would go there, and they would come here and look at our criminal justice system. And so I went as his assistant, but really what I was doing was um, researching the screenplay. Uh-huh. And so I had quite a few opportunities to do that, and but I had to do it very secretly, um, clandestinely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <Kind of. laughs> um, and it was a good screenplay. You know, it, um, uh, Paramount looked at it for a while. Um, but it, it, you know, it was kind of a touchy subject, I think, politically between the U- U.S. and China. Yeah. 
And I think that maybe um, they didn't want to do it because of uh, that that um, that kind of stress. So it didn't get done. I'm uh, I'm sad to say it's still a good screenplay though. <laughs> if anybody's yeah. interested, yeah, maybe someday, um, maybe someone will pick yeah. that up someday. You never know. You yeah. never know. But anyway, um, uh, I, I uh, further um, once I was retired and I had the time. I started to do some more writing, and mostly it was experimental. And then one day I looked at what I was writing, journalizing, basically. And I said, you know, I could turn this into a novel. Why don't I try to do that? So I did. I, you know, started working on uh, the, the, the novel that turned out to be The Laughing Bear, which yes. is now published. Um, you can get it on Amazon.com. Um, you can get it in a hard copy or a soft copy, or you can even get it on Kindle if you like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a fairly good story, I think. Um, it's about four people who, um, uh, three of them are approaching old age, and one of them is a bit younger, but in his um, 40s. And um, it's about unfinished business when you get to be a little bit older in your life you know you start looking at things and saying wait a minute you know I really wanted to do this Mm -hmm. and why didn't I ever get that done and Mm -hmm. um and so it's about getting those things done and um uh, so it's it's about four people who who um are associated because they live at a um bed and breakfast called the uh, Laughing Bear Bed and Breakfast okay. in a charming little town called Dancing Bear Springs in California Mountain. And um, the characters, I think, are quite charming and lovely, um, based on some, some real people, but I fic- fictionalized it completely. I did nothing uh, in it other than the characters of the people were real. But, you know, I did use these people that I knew as characters. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, they, you, they say, write what you know, and that's what I knew. Exactly. So I did that. <laughs> and uh, I, I, think, I think it's a pretty good novel. I, you know, I, I, I think that people should enjoy it, um, uh, especially people over the age of 30 who are starting to look at their uh, life in a slightly different way and saying, mm-hmm. wait, wait a minute, you know, maybe I ought to, take care of this before I get to be too old. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I look forward yeah. to reading that. You also, you did a few years back an autobiography, I believe, um, famous enough, a Hollywood memoir, I think is, was mm-hmm. that, I think that's, that's the name. That's correct. Yes, I did write that. And I had a partner, Michael Bichot, um, who was a wonderful person and, and a very good friend and, um, who has done a great deal for me as a person. And, um, certainly as a writer, he, Um, He knew that I had written um, my life story, and he called me one day saying, you know, I I have this book out about Sal Mineo, and um, it was doing pretty well. It was a a good publishing company, and he said, I want to follow it up with something, but I don't have anything at the moment, so would you mind if we partnered on it? I will edit your piece. I will add anything that seems to be missing, which, and there were a lot of things missing. I, I kind of skipped over a lot of television stuff and, um, you know, things that I didn't really care about that much. And, um, and so he came in and he filled in those gaps and, um, and he threw out some things that were, you know, completely unnecessary and he helped me a lot with it. And, and he also helped me get it published. So, um, that was, that been a, a long uh, partnership that we've had and yeah. it's been quite successful yeah yeah, yeah. and again you can the get book both was of pretty those. good too yeah huh? they're, they're both still available i believe at amazon.com i believe is that correct yes yes they indeed they are yes and i highly recommend my memoir i think it's a uh, well written um it's very truthful um i didn't um mince any words um about my life i you know i, I included the embarrassing stuff and um, <laughs> and uh, told the, the true story of my life and it's all in there so or at least up until the time I you know retired and and so 
Yeah, yeah. And got on with the writing part of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, know. were, you were talking about, you know, looking back on your life and uh, what you, with the laughing bear, what that kind of was about. And that kind of made me think, are there any things in your life that you look back over and your career possibly that you would, would you do it again? Or are there things that you would have done differently? And maybe what, what are some of those? I would do it again, but I would do it differently. Maybe worn a different I, hat, maybe no hat that day. No hat, no hat. <laughs> You're right, absolutely. I would not wear the hat. And I probably would have dressed a little more frumpily, you know. I would have, you know, not presented yep. myself as a glamour queen. Wouldn't so easily be led by your friend's suggestions. <laughs> right, yes. So, uh, no hat, but um, no, but I, you know, when I left Warner Brothers, that's what I was trying to say. I, I would have uh, gone to New York and um, tried my hand in uh, stage work oh, because wow. I think that would have um, helped me a lot um, as an actor, a performer, and certainly, you know, it might have even helped my career because people might have looked at me more as an actress rather than just a glamour girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that would have uh, made a difference. Um, I certainly always wanted to get married and have a family. And I just didn't do that very well. Um, when I finally did get married, my husband and I were together for 18 months and that was it. I, I just wasn't, um, good at marriage. Yeah. Um, I, I was too independent is the truth of it. And, um, even though I wanted to have a family, the on, on, only thing I was managed to do was to have a son named Evan. And um, he's a lovely young man, but um, I'm afraid, you know, that was it. I couldn't uh, do anything, um, couldn't add anything more to my family. Yeah. And I would like to have done that if I could have. Yeah. What are you most proud of in your life today? Well, actually, I'm most proud of the writing I'm doing. Okay. Um, to me, this, this is like the career I always should have, I might have, might have had, had I not been an actress. I, I probably would have, um, sat down and started writing a lot sooner than I did. Um, because I did want to do that and it was something that I was pretty good at. And, um, I, you know, that, that would have been quite a big change. Um, if I hadn't been an actor, I would have done that. Um, so, you know, there, you know, but life is what it is. You, you, you have to take it as it comes. Um, you know, even though some of us are very privileged, um, nobody has it really easy. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to struggle. Everybody has to struggle over something. And I certainly had to struggle over my issues, uh, as anybody else would have to struggle. So. Um, but that it's it's all good because it's um, it makes for a full life, and uh, when you retire, then you can start to do some of the things that you would have done had you you know had more time as a younger person. Sure, yeah. and that's that's an important thing I think. Well, when and you... I would t say to older people, don't give up. You can always start over again. For sure, <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you think back over your life, how would you like people to remember you? Oh, dear. Well, I i don't know. I mean, you know, they're going to remember how they remember, whatever. Um, you know, some of the things that I might have done had I um, gone to New York, for instance, and polished my acting skills a little bit and gotten known to be an actress instead of a glamour girl. Maybe um, that uh, would have been nice to be known as, you know, um, more of an actress than a, than a, a glamour puss. Um, and so that would have been good. But, you know, like I said, you have to take it as it comes. And, you know, it doesn't always work out exactly the way you want to. Yeah. Want yeah. it to. Yeah. You, so. can, you can get your new novel. It's called The Laughing Bear, as well as your autobiography, Famous Enough, A Hollywood Memoir, at Amazon.com. Right. And you can find out That's more right. about you on your Facebook page. You just search Diane McBain, correct? That's all you have to do is put that into your search engine and it will go. 
And by the way, I finished another no another novel. Oh, really? Um, right. It is it is now in the works um, to be published pretty soon. I'm hoping anyway. Um, and it's uh, uh, called The Color of Hope. Oh, wow. And I'm hoping that um, it will do really well. It's um, a story that's way out of my comfort zone, way out of my comfort zone. But I think it's a really good story. I researched it and I think I did a pretty good job. So I hope that um, in the future people will look for The Color of Hope. Yeah, it's yeah, a great well, title. By Diane yeah. McCain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely check your Facebook page and keep in contact with you and be looking for that. In the meantime, Elias and I are going to get your your new one, The Laughing Bear. We're going to read that and talk about that on an upcoming episode. Maybe we'll have you back on to talk about it. Oh, that would be wonderful. I'd love to talk about the book in more depth, depth and detail. That would be great. Yeah, this has really been a pleasure. We'd love to having you on here. I'm going to go watch all your movies and, and, and some of the ones that I haven't seen yet, but the ones I have seen, I'm a huge fan of yours. And uh, I'm just so oh, appreciative of you being here today. Well, thank you very much, Tony. It's been great. And you too, Elias. Take care. Thank you. Thank and you. hi to your son, Evan, for me. Okay? I'll tell him. I'll tell him. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed my time. Thanks so much for joining us today on Life and Laughs Podcast. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast and go ahead and click on that little bell button. That way you'll get notified each and every time we release a new episode. You can hear the audio podcast as well as get links to our Facebook and Instagram accounts. It's all on our website at lifeandlaughs.simplecast.com. On behalf of my co-host from the West Coast, Elias Israel, I'm Johnny Sanchez. We'll see you next time on Life and Laughs Podcast.